So this session is Spreading Liberty, um, and we've got four great speakers for you, Austin, Andrew, Paul, and Judd. Um, so I'll introduce them one by one as they do their speeches. So Austin will start um, his speech uh, momentarily, uh, and he's titling his speech the best talk of the conference, so high hopes. Um, Austin is the um, Director of Outreach and Engagement at the Australian Taxpayers Alliance, and he's the Chairman Emeritus um, and Founder of the Australian New Zealand Students for Liberty, um, the organisation which I now run, so one of the founding father of what I now do. Um, he previously served as Executive Officer of the Liberal Democratic Party um, and as a Director of the Australian Libertarian Society, uh, and was also the founding organiser um, of Liberty on the Rocks Australia. Um, he's currently a PhD student of Applied Mathematics uh, at the University of New South Wales and a sessional tutor of economics at Notre Dame University. Um, so yeah, I'll hand the floor over to Austin. So I, I should clarify, my talk was actually untitled until about 30 seconds ago when I was put on the spot to come up with one, and that was the first one I came up with. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here, and, and I think hopefully all of you are as well. It's, uh, it's the first afternoon of what promises to be an amazing weekend. Uh, and I'm going to start by talking about how this conference can fail, which is hopefully a cheery place to get us going. Uh, I, I'm certain that you'll all leave here with a bunch of great new knowledge about liberty and how to spread it. But if that's all that happens, the conference will be a failure. I'm also certain that you're going to make many new connections and great friendships with like-minded people. But again, if that's all that happens, this conference will be a failure. And I'm certain that you'll leave here Sunday night full of energy and enthusiasm about liberty. But if that's all that happens, this conference will be a failure. Now, this conference will only be a success if on Monday morning you take that knowledge, those connections, and that enthusiasm, and you ask yourself, how can I make the world a better, freer place? And you answer that question with action. That's what this panel is about, how to spread liberty. I won't say it's the most important panel of the entire conference, because I'm also talking on the Compassion Panel tomorrow, so it's kind of a toss-up between those two. Um, it is pretty important, though. Certainly, if you're involved with the libertarian movement and want to get more involved, or are just coming to the movement and want to get more involved, or if you're already really involved, really, it's for everyone. Um, but this is an extremely important talk, which will teach you how to make this conference a success. So specifically today, I'm going to be talking to you about leadership and how we can all improve ourselves as leaders for liberty. If you want to know how the conceptual sausage is made here, what I've done is I've incorporated elements from the Army leadership model and the Students for Liberty leadership model. So hopefully there's something for everyone here. I'm going to be establishing four levels of leadership, which I've called the advocate, the volunteer, the mobilizer, and the organizer. For those of you who like initialisms, you could call this the AVMO model of leadership. I'll also explain the most important principles and skills for us to keep in mind at each level as individuals. And finally, I'll recap by summarizing how the different levels all work together. So as I go through, I want you to identify where you think you are in this model. And I want you to listen closely to what sorts of things apply to you. For those of you who are quite new, think about how you can use these principles to become more involved. For those of you who are already quite involved, note that everything I'm saying is cumulative. At each successive level, we need to build on and consider everything from the previous levels. So I'll start by talking about the advocate. This is basically anyone who's friendly to our message and helps to spread it in their own way, but who isn't involved beyond that. It probably includes many of you in this room and certainly many more outside of it. If your involvement in the liberty movement centers around debates with friends or family or liking and sharing things on social media, you're probably an advocate. You act as a force multiplier. You take the ideas of liberty and you bring them out to the wider world. At this level of leadership, you need to focus most on developing effective communication skills, because without these, you could actually end up hurting the movement. If you've ever overheard someone or seen someone on social media and they're promoting liberty and your initial response is, please stop agreeing with me, you've found an advocate who still needs to develop those communication skills. The leadership principle that advocates need to focus on is to seek and accept responsibility. And that means to start thinking about what more you can do to help the movement. I guarantee you that every organization represented at this conference, and there are a lot of them, we all need enthusiastic people to help out. And we won't know that you're one of those enthusiastic people until you put up your hand. There's definitely opportunities for you to get involved, 
And once we know you're interested, we can start giving you these opportunities. And you can move on to the next tier of leadership. That's the volunteer. Now, the volunteer is the workhorse of the movement. You work behind the scenes. You probably never get as much credit as you should. You make sure that the registration tables are staffed. You make sure that the swag bags get filled. You make sure that the five minute speech disguised as a question gets cut off. I probably won't get to make this joke again because Tim's used an app on the phone, but if you've been to a previous conference, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Please don't ask any of those questions today. For a volunteer, the skills you need are time management and organizational. You need to live up to what you commit to. You need to find ways to go above and beyond. And you need to show up on time. Even if that time is stupid, or even when you stayed up late last night finishing a speech that you should have written a week ago. And even, oh, you know, this joke seemed a lot funnier at 2 a.m. Uh, in any case, the additional leadership principles for volunteers are to be proficient and to know yourself and seek self-improvement. So excel where you can, but work on strengthening any areas where you know you don't yet excel. Start thinking about not just what you've been tasked to do, although you need to think about that, but how you can go above and beyond that. Start paying attention to what others are doing around you and how all the pieces fit together. Because before you know it, you'll be ready to start managing other volunteers. And that's where you get to the third level of leadership, the mobilizer. These are the people among us who can take charge of entire events. They delegate the tasks to the volunteers. You need to remember who is in charge of buying the coffee, where the hot water urn is stored, and which volunteer is available to run out and get the cups that you forgot to buy until you poured your cup of coffee 30 minutes before the first events came and you couldn't get it anywhere. This happened at the first Students for Liberty conference. We had coffee, we had an urn, and no cups. So <laughs> we were able to rectify that and it went off without a hitch, but um, this is the job of the mobilizer because what you need are management skills. You need to be meticulously, meticulously planning and you need to be able to efficiently delegate. And at the end of the day, when all of your meticulous planning and your efficient delegation fall apart, you need to be ready to think on your feet and solve those problems. Mobilizers need to consider three more leadership principles, and that's to lead by example, to know and care for your subordinates, and to make sound and timely decisions. The volunteers are gonna be watching you closely, and not just because I told them to do it a minute or so ago. They'll look up to you. They'll follow your example. If you don't respond to emails, they won't respond to emails. If you show up late, they'll show up late. You have a responsibility to them as well because volunteers will run themselves ragged if you let them. They're keen, but they don't always take care of themselves. You gotta make sure that they take breaks. Take breaks to eat. Take breaks to caffeinate or nap. Caffeine is usually our preferred, uh, preferred drug of choice at these conferences, although we're libertarians. Could be anything. <laughs> um, and you want to make sure that they get some recognition for the work they're doing. I think that's probably a, a, a big flaw that some mobilizers fall into, is that they delegate to their volunteers, the volunteers do an amazing job, and then it's thanks, go home. So make sure that these volunteers who are working so hard and getting there so early are getting the credit they deserve. Lastly, when things go wrong, and I want to reiterate this, because they will go wrong, they will always go wrong, you're the one on the ground who has to decide how to fix the problems quickly and decisively. And now we come to our dear leaders within the liberty movement. These are the organizers. They're the ones who are setting the organizational priorities. They're helping to train up the next generation of leaders. The pay isn't great, the hours are long, but at the end of the day, you'll probably have a more impressive Facebook friend list than anyone you know, and that's what it's all about. <laughs> you're, you're the lens that focuses the great power of the liberty movement, and, and I guess you're, you're vaporizing the anti-statism in, in what has proven to be a really disgusting metaphor. Um, the uh, serious thing though, I, I, I was gonna thank Tim Andrews right now, but he's actually left for a VIP event, <laughs> doing exactly what an organizer should be doing, uh, and that's leaving the day-to-day -day running of these individual things to the organizers while he goes off and, and takes care of the vision of the movement. So organizers need to be talented leaders. Leadership is not some mystical gift that a chosen few are born with. It's a skill like any other, and it's gotta be trained and honed through hard work. Well, good management will get things done. Good leadership will make people want to do things. And the skills I've mentioned before, communication, organization, management, they're all necessary, but none of them are quite sufficient to being a good leader. So as you might expect, organizers have even more leadership principles to consider. In addition to everything I've discussed before, they need to be able to set direction. They need to keep their team informed. They need to de develop the potential of their subordinates and they need to build the team and challenge its abilities. They are working to identify the best place to target the efforts of the movement as a whole. And they have to communicate that direction through their organizers, and often even directly to volunteers and advocates. 
But perhaps most importantly, they need to be focused on building the team and creating new leaders because no one lives forever. Some of us will have our heads frozen when we die, but it's still a risk. <laughs> most of us won't live forever. Uh, and, and we need to, to ensure that the next generation of the Liberty Movement has all of the skills, all of the experience that we did. We don't want to let that die with us. We want to make sure that the people are coming through to carry the torch of liberty into future generations. So putting this all together, the Liberty Movement consists of advocates, volunteers, mobilizers, and organizers. No matter which of these levels we're at, each of us needs to be constantly thinking how we can take on more responsibility and also be encouraging those around us to do the same. The organizers are acting strategically. They're setting priorities, deciding what issues to push. Broadly, how best to do that, they're focusing on building up their volunteers and their mobilizers and getting them at higher levels of responsibility and accountability. The mobilizers are the tacticians. They're executing the plans of the organizers and they're ensuring that the volunteers know what to do and that they have the resources to do it. And the volunteers are the ones who make things work. Everything that the mobilizers and organizers do is focused through their efforts on the ground. Finally, the advocates. They multiply the impact of these volunteers, these mobilizers, these organizers. And ultimately, they're where our future leaders are going to come from. The people who starts out just by liking or sharing a post, and then comes along to an event, and then puts up their hand to volunteer, and then starts organizing their own events, and eventually starts running a think tank, or founding a think tank, or, or, or doing something else amazing for the liberty movement, like running for vice president. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's one group I haven't yet mentioned yet, and that's everyone who hasn't yet heard our message, or who doesn't yet agree with us enough to be an advocate. Ultimately, everything we do is focused on them, because we don't want to just take people who are already in the movement and make them great leaders. We want to make them great leaders so the movement can grow. So the end goal is to take them future advocates and make them advocates, and then make them leaders as well, and get more advocates, and so on and so on, and then we get Libertopia. So to go back here to where I started, if you don't all go out there on Monday and keep advancing as Leaders for Liberty, this conference could be a failure, but I know it won't. I know that you guys are gonna listen to the things that are said here and tomorrow and on Sunday, and I know that you're gonna think about how can I best take these ideas and change the world. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Austin. Um, yeah, just so in, in terms of Q&A, um, I think the biggest, best and quickest way we could do this is that if you have any questions after hearing any of the speeches, um, send me a message on Wova. So I'm Ahmed Sullivan, just look for my name and send me a message. And then once all the speakers are done, I'll read out some of your questions. So yeah, just send me a message on Wova. Um, so the next talk is from Andrew Cooper. Andrew is uh, the president of Liberty Works in Queensland. Um, he's also a director of a number of private companies and holds um, positions in community organisations other than Liberty Works. Uh, he's also an avid micro lender and donor to third world businesses through Keeper.org, um, an organisation that helps um, empower third world entrepreneurs. Um, and the title of his speech is The Dinner Party Conversation. Which sounds good. Over to Andrew. Well, thanks very much. It's a bit daunting um, uh, following uh, the greatest speech at the conference, so uh, just bear with me. Um, look, I've titled this The Dinner Party Conversation. I'd put it as a... Uh, it, what I'm trying to share with you is basically a tool that, uh, that um, I think uh, most can use as an advocate uh, uh, out there in, in terms of uh, uh, influencing others uh, to thinking libertarian. Now, I don't know about you, but... Uh, when I go to uh, some of my friends' uh, dinner parties or perhaps barbecues, uh, I get dragged along there as the, uh, the token, li token libertarian. The sole purpose among some of my lefty socialist sort of uh, authoritarian uh, mates is basically to get me drunk and get me engaged in some sort of political discussion in which they can uh, throw me under a bus, <laughs> preferably uh, you know, with others watching. Uh, now, I, you know, I've got friends like this. I've got some uni mates, uh, and they're terribly wordy, urbane, uh, wealthy, uh, inner-city types that love their expensive Chardonnays and uh, uh, Penfold St. Henri's. Um, and uh, um, they have a sense of moral superiority that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that sort of looks down on, uh, on selfish libertarianism. Uh, and so at these types of events, I've basically, you know, I've got, I've got two strategies. One is to just ignore it all, just uh, uh, talk footy, um, don't get engaged, but 
the second strategy, which I think uh, is important in terms of spreading liberty, is that if there are other people at that uh, dinner party, if there are people there that uh, have an open mind, that they haven't got the closed off uh, sort of Marxist view of the world, then it's probably worth having a crack at trying to influence them. Now, at these types of events, uh, basically, in my experience, the, the key to making this uh, work is in the setup of the conversation. So, you know, you're around a dinner table, everyone's having a, a, a nice time, and then at some point, someone, typically uh, your sort of your, your frenemy, will say something like, uh, you know, try to bait you into uh, talking about uh, taxation or gun control or, or something like that. So, in my experience, that's a trap. Um, <laughs> it's a big trap. Uh, the libertarian falls into the trap of uh, stating the position and then trying to defend it. Uh, and you'll get punch drunk. Um, the questions, the challenges, the charges, they'll come from everywhere. Uh, and it leaves us having to defend these uh, challenges. And, and really, what's the upside? Um, basically, you're there uh, getting exhausted. Uh, you're trying to think. Uh, you're probably saying too much. You're not thinking enough. And uh, if anything, you're doing the position a, a disservice, not a credit. So, so what's the what's what's the what's the solution? Well, I think the fact that once you state a position and then you're constantly trying to defend that position, that gives us clues to what the solution is. Um, the solution is to basically put them on the defensive, get them to state their position, get them to answer your questions. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a trick. I'll, I'll try to share with you a trick that I believe will work for everyone. It certainly worked for me. It took me about 20 years to work it out because uh, after you get some, so punch drunk for so long, after a while you, 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 you're, you're this close from giving up. So here's the thing. Um, when the question of our crazy libertarian beliefs starts to come around, we should not engage in any debate at that point until we agree on some common ground between the parties. And there's one thing we need to agree on with the protagonists before commencing, and it's this. If we're going to discuss politics, it should be in a civil and safe manner. Don't you agree? Say that to your friend. And they'll say, of course it is. So regardless of any disagreements between us, neither of us will grab a gun and force the other to do something they don't want to do. Are we agreed? Use the word gun, right? <laughs> not force, not coercion. It's a trigger word, excuse the pun, for your average soci socialist or authoritarian lefty. The mental gymnastics they need to perform to reject that statement would be mind-blowing for them. We'll get back to that later because their minds will be blowing. But the statement should agree upon again is this. So regardless of any disagreements between us, neither of us will grab a gun and force the other to do something they don't want to. Agreed? Now, if you can get to, to agree to that statement, in my opinion, you've got them. The tables are turned. With practice, you'll be able to box them in and you'll be able to end up influencing the independents around the table to look at libertarians for you. Because look, what have they agreed to? They've agreed not to use force to get their way. What have they agreed to? They've agreed to uh, not the non-aggression principle, the NAP. So, you've baited the hook. You've got agreement on common ground. We're not going to force each other to do something at the end of a gun that we don't want, that we don't want to do. So, let's go back to the dinner party. Michael, my socialist friend, now that we've agreed, to contact, we've agreed to conduct ourselves civilly, what would you like to talk about? Throw the bait out. Maybe the tax in this country is way too high. Whoa. <laughs> tax isn't too high. Oh, that's crazy. You crazy libertarians. That's right. You want to slash taxes. And away we go. Now, the temptation here is to leap in and explain why lower taxes is morally superior, that taxation is theft, that lower taxation leaves people better off, etc., etc. But as we saw before, that's really hard work. Uh, that puts you in the position of justifying, defending your statement. Much better to turn the tables. So when they say, that's right, you crazy libertarians want to slash tax, then you say to them, do you like tax? Boom. Right? Tables turn. 
And they'll say something like, well, not really, but taxes are needed to look after the poor, you know, provide for people that can't afford to look after themselves, or something like that. Uh, and you say, so tax is good. It does good things. And they'll say, yes, of course it does. And you'll work them around, you'll ask them, is it a moral thing? Because it does good things, if, is it moral and right, right that we all contribute? Of course it is, they'll say. And then you'll say, and if you don't pay tax? And they'll say, everyone should pay their taxes. And you say, so if people don't pay their taxes, are they basically immoral? And they'll say, yes, we well, will get them there. Now, at this point, really, this is where you, you're sort of in control now. You see what's happened? The tables are turned. Now, you can have a little bit of fun at this point, in my experience. Um, it's a slight distraction from the main game, but it's funny watching the socialists get their head around this. Uh, so you can say that almost half the population doesn't pay any net tax. Uh, where's Simon? Is anyone from the IPA here? Brilliant research from the IPA. So half the population doesn't pay any net tax. Uh, is that half of the population immoral? Uh, they, if they're sharp, they may say no. Uh, they may say something like, uh, well, that's not fair. They still pay their PAYE. Uh, and even if, they, even if they get a little bit more back. And you can say something like, so if I made a $100 donation to the Red Cross and then they gave me $120 back, I'd still be a moral person, right? Confuses them, off, off being. No matter, back to the main game. So you've got them on the defensive about tax. You ask them something like, so the budget isn't balanced. Should, should we do more? Should we pay more tax to balance the budget? They're socialists, right? What are they going to do? Of course we should. Who should pay more tax? Well, they'll say something like, well, rich people should pay more tax. Companies should pay more tax. The greedy bastards. Now, at this point, I like to switch to the first person. OK, you've got their position, you've got them agreeing that it's a moral thing, that it's, uh, that it's rich people that should be paying more tax. Then you, say, then you can say something like, well, I'm doing OK, but I don't want to pay more tax. It's not fair. It's not fair that I have to pay lots of tax while half the population doesn't. You know what? Stuff it. Stuff you. I'm not paying it anymore. I'm going to avoid paying so much tax and pay what I think is fair. What are you going to do about it? Well, they'll say something like, well, you have to pay. It's the law. And then I'll retort, well, I'm not paying. Get stuffed. What are you going to do about it? You'll be summoned to court and you'll get fined. And I'll say, I'm not paying the stupid fine either. What are you going to do about that? <coughs> you'll be arrested. You'll be taken to court. By who? The police, you idiot. <laughs> Cops with guns. Yes, you stupid fool, is the typical response. You've got them. I'm calling you out on that. You said at the beginning that regardless of any disagreements between us, you would not use a gun to force me to do something I don't want to do. You're using guns to force me to do something you want me to do, but I don't. Now, that's the difference. Now, get, you've got to use this line too. That's the difference between libertarians and you. You use force to get what you want. We don't. We are peace-loving, you are people, you people are gun-loving control freaks. <laughs> Mind explodes, right? Head goes off. Now they all splutter and defend and justify and carry on like pork chops about the law, that they're not using a gun, but, they, but you know what? They've lost the main game. Um, and that's about influencing others. The roles have been reversed. So they'll exhaust themselves trying to defend the indefensible, while all you've done is ask sensible questions in a calm, rational manner. And for the other, others in the room, what are they thinking? Hopefully a seed of an idea that hasn't yet got a name for them has been germinated. The non-aggression principle for me is our greatest secret, but it's, the, it's a hard concept to communicate, it's a hard concept to defend. Best to have it illustrated by the socialists. In summary, get them to agree to the statement, regardless of any disagreements between us, you would not use a gun to force me to do something I don't want to do. Ask questions, stay calm, be the example of libertarian cool, and influence others by illustrating the nap. It's the nap that makes our philosophy unique, consistent, and morally defensible.
It's pointless arguing to belittle each other amongst ourselves. Sure, we argue here because we sharpen our arguments in that way. But there's no point making enemies here. It's a big umbrella. There's many, there's, there's more important fish to fry. And that's the great big world out there. The journey to freedom is a long road and we need all the friends we can find and good luck in spreading the message of liberty. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. A lot of practical advice there. Um, so we'll move on to um, Paul's uh, speech, which is um, titled The Use of Diverse Coalitions to Expand um, Liberty. Uh, so Paul Blair is the Strategic Initiatives Director for Americans for Tax Reform, which is a Washington DC based tax advocacy and research organization founded in 1985 um, at the request of President Reagan. Um, he has been at the forefront of the vaping movement in the United States, organizing the Right to Vape Tour, a national campaign and bus tour spanning 20 states. Uh, he's also been published in the Washington Post, the National Review, Forbes, New York Post, um, and the Richmond Times Dispatch. Uh, so I'll welcome Paul Blair to the stage. You don't need to play right now. No, not yet, not yet. We'll do that at the end. Um, so I'm not only going to talk about vaping, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on that at the end. Um, but when I was asked to give um, kind of a broad overview of uh, a little bit about what Americans for Tax Reform does um, and its relationship to expanding liberty, uh, it, it's kind of helpful first to talk about how we engage in public policy and political activism in the United States. I think in all of your um, packs, there is a map, a, a map of the world in some of, uh, I think in 17 countries now, um, we do a broad range of coalition building between public, uh, or, or work with organizations that do coalition building between think tanks, legislators, lawmakers, members of parliament, regulators, um, lobbyists, consumer groups, kind of the broad coalition of consumers and businesses and interested parties uh, who believe in more limited government, lower taxes, more freedom, not necessarily all of those things, but maybe one of those things. In the US, um, certainly uh, uh, where, where most of my work is focused, uh, we do that in every single state. And so while our primary objective is stopping tax increases and under the right political conditions, um, pushing for lower taxes, certainly one of the things we're discussing in Washington, D.C. now as a result of last November's election. Um, that's step one, because cutting off uh, the amount of money that we give to those who hate us and seek to control our lives uh, is, is only one part of expanding, limer, expanding liberty and promoting limited government. And so a lot of what we do, uh, both in the United States and certainly with our partnerships around the world, um, is, is find issues and create coalitions around causes that are both traditional. Uh, many of the causes that we talked about earlier in some of our campaigns, lower taxes, less regulations, uh, are not necessarily new ideas, although we find new applications when targeted by particular laws or particular, re particular regulations. But the focus of my kind of talk today about expanding liberty is reaching outside of the things that we believe in because we either learned about um, libertarianism or the limited government movement through academia or through our readings or through our philosophical upbringings. But in expanding into what, what we've heard a little bit about today, these new groups of people who may not care about um, you know, the academic uh, exercise of uh, a libertarianism or center-right conservatism, um, but are more impacted by what they do when they get up, when they go to work, when they come home, and when they're targeted uh, by the government or regulations. And so one of the benefits of uh, being a conservative or a libertarian is that the government and our foes constantly create new allies for us and for our movement, um, whether it be because they seek to tax or regulate or ban things that we enjoy and like and need to make a living. They are constantly creating uh, new advocates and and new opportunities for our efforts in the in the movement to expand liberty. And so, you know, when we think about what we're going to do on Monday, um, figuring out how to message to our friends or traditional allies is important. 
But I, identifying new coalitions, um, diverse coalitions, uh, is also extremely important because if you're not hyper obsessed with the political dialogue on Twitter and Facebook, and I hope that you're not, um, but if you're not hyper obsessed with these things, you may not really know or care or be uh, fiscally inclined to engage in public policy debates until you're targeted by the government, whether it's through licenses or regulations or ban bans or taxes. And so, um, uh, you know, to reach back to what happened in November of this, this past year, I'll give a brief preview as to what Grover is going to talk about tomorrow night when United finally lets him get here, um, is, is the use of diverse coalitions through the lens of looking at what happened in the presidential election in the United States last year. Um, I, I've only briefly got an understanding of how the election was covered in Australia, um, uh, which is, I guess, not too dissimilar as to how it was covered in Washington, D.C., which is that Hillary Clinton was absolutely going to win and Donald Trump um, was absolutely going to lose. Um, but obviously those things were wrong, and it's, it wasn't only magic that made that happen. Um, but I would go so far as to argue that it was a diverse set of coalitions and, and a political movement um, on the center right that had been put in motion years ago. A couple of examples. Um, in Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign, um, whether it's because she didn't understand the political climate of the United States, uh, because you know her political existence or the political existence of her husband was 20 years uh, a little too early, um, or because uh, the labor unions and those on the left simply don't care, uh, went to war with a diverse set of coalition partners who are new friends of the liberty movement um, that Hillary Clinton missed. And those are the energy sector, so coal miners who are out of work in West Virginia. West Virginia is a state, if you know anything about geography in the United States, West Virginia is a state relatively low income, but heavily reliant on the energy sector, um, that actually voted for Bill Clinton. Donald Trump won West Virginia by 42 points, one of the largest margins he had across the entire country. Well, part of that certainly had to do with the regulatory climate and the war on coal uh, in the United States and by the uh, Obama administration, and certainly uh, one that was continued by many of what the beliefs of Hillary Clinton. And so energy employees manufacture, and this extended to oil, natural gas as well. And so when you have hundreds of thousands of people and their families reliant on an element of the industry, uh, an industry that someone who's running for president seeks to destroy, that is a new uh, activist and addition to the liberty movement. Um, education, homeschoolers and, and, uh, and charter schoolers. We have two million people who are homeschooled in the United States right now. Uh, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, it was illegal to homeschool your kid. Well, Hillary Clinton and what many in the United States understand, um, if you are uh, a, a homeschooler or a family impacted by homeschooling, you know that the left uh, at the first opportunity would ban that and require you to go to public schools funded by taxpayers with limited no choice for your families. Well, homeschoolers, their parents, their families, their neighbors are new additions to the liberty movement because our foes um, are very helpful in recruiting uh, new additions to this cause. Um, gun owners, concealed carry permit holders, 15 million in the United States. Again, 35 years ago, there were none. It was illegal. And so um, these are folks who know that at the first chance, the first opportunity, the left in the United States will curb their ability to exercise the Second Amendment. These are new additions, new diverse additions to the liberty movement. The sharing economy, Uber, Lyft, Airbnb. Hillary Clinton said that at, uh, she wanted to end the so-called gig economy, that she wanted to crack down on independent contracting. Well, there's 600,000 people who drive for Uber in the United States. These are people who like the flexibility associated with independent contracting, who don't like big regulations, who don't want to be taxed out of existence, and who are new entrants to the liberty movement. Not only because they want to be able to drive folks around and get paid to do it, but because they believe in independent contracting and entrepreneurship. And so that was certainly very helpful uh, that, that she wasn't on our side on that. And then vapors, uh, again, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but in the United States, we have uh, about 8 to 10 million people who use electronic cigarettes and vapor products. And President Barack Obama imposed regulation that by next year will put every single manufacturer of these products out of business unless they get approval from our Food and Drug Administration uh, to continue to sell the products. So these are people, former smokers in the United States, generally tend to be center left, 
Um, certainly in every presidential uh, election, um, although pre-2012 their products didn't really exist in the United States, generally smokers, generally a, a center-left constituency, these are people who believe they're making better health choices for themselves. Uh, many of them are new entrepreneurs um, who saw a, a, a president put in place a policy that stands to end their well-being and was an attack on their personal public and public health decisions. And so very helpful in um, attracting new entrants to the liberty movement. And so, you know, how do you work with these people? The left helps us recruit them. How do we work with them? What is, you know, how do we capitalize on, on, on you know, the opposition uh, to, to freedom? Well, uh, number one, you got to reach out. Um, certainly, the dinner party conversations are extremely important. Um, but as activists or those who represent organizations, reach out to the associations, the groups, and the businesses that are being targeted by the government um, and offer to help them. Write op-eds, write blog posts, write letters to the editor on their behalf, leveraging your coalition and leveraging your network uh, to, to help with, with the new cause. Um, and that will make you very popular. It'll expand your base of activism. It'll expand your coalition. And it will expand uh, the, the liberty movement. And what we learned in the United States over the last three years of our work on tax and regulatory issues in the, in the vaping space is that once you have attracted someone to the broad liberty movement because you have touched on an issue that is their vote moving issue, whether it is guns, whether it is education, whether it is high car taxes, whether it is wearing a helmet or not, whether it's vaping, is that um, it is possible to connect the dots politically on the broader uh, fight for freedom, low taxes, and limited government. We have seen millions of people who are formerly center left who are impassioned about a consumer product that they use sharing our blog post and content about the Trump tax plan, uh, who may have 18 months ago considered themselves socialists. And so there is an opportunity in identifying specific issues to expand the movement broadly uh, if you reach out and if you leverage your coalition and your network to help them uh, in their fight against stupid government. And so I just wanted to play uh, a brief 45 seconds from a video that we did. Um, as We did a, a, a national bus tour last year to um, educate folks and turn up activists as part of the National Right to Vape tour. And we did about four um, kind of documentary episodes taking stories from consumers and businesses to highlight the impact of this regulation, delivering messages to legislators um, and the president. And so there was a, there was a very political um, element to this, um, and I just want to play a brief 45-second uh, story from a uh, consumer in Oregon who had a message for her senator about this issue. But I want you to know something, and I mean this for the, from the bottom of my heart. I'm a Democrat. I've been a Democrat my whole life. I like you. I really do. But you got to change on vaping. I vote. And I've always voted, and I always will vote. So you better take it serious, because ain't nobody playing about this. People are tired of this. You're, you're, you're not treating us right. If you can, if you can get the, the law fixed for the people that like growlers, then you can get the law fixed for people that vape. Um, she said Senator Wyden at the beginning. Anyways. Uh, so Senator Wyden, uh, among the most anti-vaping uh, politicians in the United States, um, a Democrat who is not helpful to this cause, uh, we recruited a lot of Democrats to share these messages with their senators. Um, and ironically, some of them, um, well, some of them have uh, evolved to the right position, some of them have not. But the broader point why I wanted to show this is that uh, we are leveraging uh, a regulatory war on a consumer product for a broader political movement. And I think um, that is an extremely important point when we think about and talk about expanding liberty, because there is a political element to this. And it's just very important to um, identify these issues and these causes for that purpose. And so um, if you're interested in the vapor issue, I'm happy to talk later over uh, a beer or 10. Um, uh, I'm not going to focus any more on it today. Uh, I know that there are discussions throughout the weekend that will touch on that issue as well, uh, but certainly appreciate it. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so we'll move on to the last um, speaker of the session and the last speaker of the day.
uh, which uh, is Judd Weiss. Uh, so Judd is a former um, vice presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party uh, of the United States. Um, he's a former very successful real estate agent with Remax uh, and is, is in the Hall of Fame and also a very successful entrepreneur. Um, he's become noteworthy in libertarian circles, as, so, uh, as some of you might know, uh, for his uh, frequent high-quality cocktail photography uh, involving, you know, many high-profile people, including the likes of Gary Johnson and Peter Schiff. Uh, he's gone to a level where there's about 20,000 Facebook profile photos now attributed to him, um, which is rather impressive. Um, he, he raises profile as a writer and as a frequent conference speaker as well. Um, and he focuses his message on connecting with people. And he successfully brought the political ideas of liberty um, to many people who would otherwise be opposed to it or apathetic. Now, Judd's um, talk uh, is titled How to Connect and Sell Liberty, uh, which is yeah, appropriate. So, Judd. My friends. Imagine you have a car you want to sell. Now imagine if while you're trying to sell this car, you try to convince your buyer that he's a complete idiot. Imagine how that will affect the sale. Because that is our sales approach in the liberty movement. We are trying to fight with people and, and, and smash truth into their face and high five our friends and who smashed truth in their face the hardest. <laughs> And what does, that, what does that get us? If we are right, if we are telling people the truth, that gets people defending themselves from the truth. And it gets people defending themselves from us. And in fact, that is what the case is. So not only are we, the, the liberty message needs innovation. I was, I was just running as a VP candidate with John McAfee, the Libertarian Party in, in America. And we, we were desperately trying to break all the rules. Because the, the way that everything is going right now, it's so stale, boring, and stifling, and annoying. So that, that is us. That is the liberty movement right now as it stands. That, that would be my report card, is we are stale, we are boring, we're crusty, we're stifling, and we are annoying people. And that's what needs to change. And if we don't, say, if we don't speak straight about it, we have no hope. We might as well just go home, because our message is not going to resonate. We, the Libertarian Party specifically has gotten nowhere for 50 years. For the last several decades, they've been the nerds in the corner that have been disregarded. And they're going to continue that way unless things change. And so we have to be very honest about what's going on. And that's what I'm trying to talk about here. Uh, the, the, there, there's a lot that I like to focus on. My background, a lot, a lot of people know me in the Liberty Movement as taking a lot of photos. I've, you've seen these black and white photos on Facebook. Not as much in Australia, but you might have seen American friends and, and, and there's friends from international conferences with these black and white photos. I didn't want to debate with other libertarians that we were, our image is terrible. I didn't want to debate that we're doing things wrong. I just wanted to show people because otherwise I'm just a I'm one of the nerds fighting with another of the nerds and that's just not going to get us anywhere. So I just wanted to take a camera and show people. Now I'm so OCD that I've gone so far down the rabbit hole that there's just way too many photos out there now. And I want more people to, to start bringing that up. But the idea is we can improve our image. We can improve our presentation. We can look more exciting. And none of that is an ideological debate. None of that is an ideological argument. And I'm not making that. All I'm trying to say is maybe instead of being the socially awkward nerds you want to avoid, maybe this is something cool you might want to be a part of. And that's, that's just a very simple thing. Because if we think about it, by definition, half of the population is below average intelligence. Is that right? <laughs> right by definition. And instead, we're fighting over the, the top 5% of the population that is intellectual. And that's, that's generous, maybe the top 2%. But we're, there, how many tens of millions of people are in Australia? 20, 30 million? I don't know. But they're not all in this room. And they don't all go to conferences. Most of them don't. Most of them are completely uninterested in going to a political conference. If we're into politics, we've crossed that threshold of being nerds. We're all nerds here. <laughs> everybody here, and everybody even a lot less interested in politics has already crossed that threshold. What we need to do is now communicate to the people who are not nerds, who are not into this, who are not obsessive about politics. And that's OK. Right now, we're, we're criticizing people for just being for sharing memes and we're calling them slacktivists and we're, we're, that we're more engaged. 
But there's a lot of people out there that are just focusing on medicine, on plumbing, uh, on basic skills and their, their lives, and they're not going to get into this. And that's OK. And we need to connect to them. Desperately, we need to connect to them. And we need to get outside of our bubble. So that's what I'm focusing on. Um, th there's, there's several elements of that. But what I want to really focus on here is in all organizations and companies, there's a, we, we're, we're capitalists, we believe in a division of labor. And in most companies, there's a, there's a reason why the engineers are not the salesmen. It's a very different skill set, right? The engineers have to be right. They have to have, make sure that everything lines up. Otherwise, you have a terrible product. If they can't, if the engineers can't sleep at night if all the numbers don't add up. And that's a sign of a good engineer. And that's, a, that's very valuable. But that's not sales. Salesmen have to connect with people. They have to understand people. Their, their focus is not the product and, and understanding how it works to such the nth degree. Their, their focus is understanding people. Right? It's a very different skill set. And right now, the problem with the Libertarian Party and the movement as a whole, to a lesser extent, is that the engineers are dominating the sales department. All of the messaging has to appeal to all the engineering. And, and there's, it's very common in companies to have the engineers fight with the salesmen, because the, the salesmen are constantly dumbing it down or keeping it simple. And it's not, the, it's not what the engineers were originally intending to do. And so we, we have that constant conflict. And right now, we're an intellectual movement. And, and the intellectuals are completely and totally dominating the messaging. It all has to appeal to us. So I had this, I had this opportunity to, uh, to run with McAfee, who's a complete maniac, who has nothing to do with politics at all. I, I don't know. How many people here know who McAfee is? Yeah, so he ran for he, McAfee antivirus is on everybody's computer. He sold out his portion of the company in the 90s before the internet even took off. He sold out his portion for $100 million. He ended up retiring in Belize, and uh, he ran into some serious corruption with the government and escaped through the jungles, with the manhunt through the jungles for him, and came back to America with nothing. Zero. He was totally broke. And then he decided to run for president. <laughs> And I decided to join him <laughs> because I was a McAfee fan. Because McAfee was cool, and all we were, all I wanted with the the campaign, all I wanted desperately was for once in history for the Libertarian Party to have a cool option. That's all I wanted, if nothing else. Because uh, unfortunately, I feel like this time when people looked at the Libertarian Party and, and as an option amongst Trump and Hillary, and they were desperately looking for another option. They were like, that's lame, screw that. And all I wanted was, that's interesting, what's that about? I didn't want anything more than that. I just wanted us to be interesting for the first time. That's it. And, and I also wanted to do it in a very different way. I didn't want to fight with people. I didn't want to argue. I just wanted us to be the interesting option that was kind of cool. And a lot of, a lot of what we're doing uh, with, when we're fighting with people and we're arguing, what that does is it, it factionalizes everybody into enemies. And, and in, even among the Libertarian Party, forget about the movement, the party itself has about 17 different warring factions. Uh, and the, the movement, each think tank is its own faction. But if you look at the Liberty Movement, there's all these different organizations, all these different think tanks. Sometimes there's little squabbles here or there. But it's generally peaceful. People do their own thing. And deliver, but if you imagine all of those organizations suddenly disappeared and they were gone, and all of the liberty movement had to decide uh, by vote, it, it all became one organization. They had to decide by vote which way the liberty movement is going to go. You can imagine it would be really hostile in the liberty movement all of a sudden. That's the Libertarian Party, and that's part of why it's got a problem, is because everybody's fighting over one direction, one message. It's all got to be this way. And you can imagine what would happen in the liberty movement. But we, if we are factionalizing ourselves amongst everybody else, what we need to do is, is reimagine that, that ideas are not people. People are not ideas. We all held views that we, didn't, we don't now, and we might not hold the same exact views in the future. I, we, we're vessels for ideas. And our war isn't with people, it's with ideas. We're at a war of ideas right now, and we can consider it a war. But the, the, but the targets are not people. The targets are ideas. And what we need to do is fundamentally reimagine people 
as potential allies or potential customers. Because my background is not in photography. That's actually relatively new. It's only been a few years that, since I got into it. I'm just OCD. My background is not in art direction or, or any like marketing or creative endeavor. My background's in sales. And my idea is about, my skill set is about getting very stubborn people to move. Because I sell buildings owned by very difficult, stubborn, high value people. And I need to get these, these guys to work together no matter how stubborn they are write big checks and have a big smile on their face about it. And I need to get people to move. And so I'm looking at the libertarian movement as, as failing as a sales organization. F failing, I would say we're about F or below in our ability to, to attract people, to uh, make them feel comfortable with what we're talking about, and, and to make it digestible and simple enough that they even understand what the hell we're talking about. We're, we're a fail in all of that. And so we can't make any sales. We're, 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 we're only selling to the intellectuals, where we're ignoring everybody else. So we need to treat people as potential customers. We need to understand them. And we need to encourage those people that can communicate and, and do that. Uh, how the hell are we going to teach and communicate our ideas of, of tolerance and respect when we're intolerant and disrespectful when we do it? That's one of our main problems. Also. Uh, we can't get our message across if we're just throwing 1,200-page novels at people or uh, human action or we're giving them a stack of things to read. We need to keep this dead simple just to get them in. And that was our, our whole approach with this campaign. And so I got to put these ideas in action uh, with this campaign. And I've got a couple of videos that I want to show you that gives you a little bit of sense of where I was going with this. Because my role with McAfee was specifically He's a bit rough around the edges. He's a really interesting, dynamic character. But I wanted to reimagine his packaging and therefore show that we could package ourselves differently. Because what we desperately need in this movement, in the party, definitely, but in the movement and as a whole, is to, re, to, to encourage more innovation. Transportation industry has been stale. We were trying to push some more innovation in that. And we've got Uber re recently. A lot of other industries are stale. And the libertarian movement is stale, and we need innovation. So I was just trying to forget all these rules. I want, I'm not even interested in being a politician. I don't even want to hold political office. It sounds miserable to me. But I, I wanted the Libertarian Party uh, race to be, that campaign was just a platform to speak and show a different way. So this first video uh, that she's about to play, uh, I want to say a few words, is I needed to, when I got announced, Nobody really believed it, uh, that I was, I was running with McAfee. It was, it was really crazy. Uh, I was throwing a, a cocktail party fundraiser for him. And at that party, it was announced that I was running. And while, while we were leading up to the party is when I was even asked to join him. And it felt like a, a band was in town, and they're about to go on a European tour. And I just dumped on the bus. I didn't want to miss that. So, but, but I wanted to reimagine what we could do. And I needed this first video to show what I'm bringing to the table. So I took a lot of photos of the liberty movement around the world. And, and I wanted to make a very, dumb, very, very, very simple ad. And I got, I got attacked by Libertarian Party members for this because they're asking, where are my policy positions? But I didn't want to make an engineer spec sheet for other nerds. I wanted to just make something very simple, this first ad, and to show some, some reason why you want to be a part of this. So go ahead and play this first video. Take a look at this.
So that was different. I just wanted to do something fresh and new and totally different. And I got to show off how I was presenting the scene. And, and, and there was a policy position in there, hammered very hard at the end with three words, let life live, because that's essentially what we're all about. And I felt like that's something that people could feel comfortable with. And, and that's all we're trying to do is, can people feel comfortable with what we're doing? Now, um, I, the next video I have, I, wanna sh I, I, also, I went in another completely different direction. All the videos were different because I didn't want to show one way to message. I wanted to show different ways that we can communicate that are, and, and I didn't want my videos to be the, the only ways to do it. I wanted to show very different templates, essentially, that people can understand. They could break the rules, reimagine things, and, and do something really fresh and interesting. This next video actually has uh, Nick Gillespie is in it in this room. He, he's over there. He, see if you can spot him in the video. He's, he makes an appearance. But this next video, I wanted to bring a lot more attention to McAfee. And also, I wanted to, I, I wanted to, the words that McAfee is saying here are, I want a different way to approach and pitch the liberty movement. So check this one out. Go ahead and play the second video. And then double click inside. to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. That was the first time I ever edited video in my life. I just installed an app to try it out. I only knew C was cut tool and B was select tool in Adobe Premiere. And so the point is, if you have sensibilities, you can just play with things and figure something out. And I just wanted to do something different and fresh and interesting. And the idea there was, if things suck the way they are, then be a hero, change the world, vote different. I wanted people to feel like the ones that are doing things differently aren't the ones that are the weird runts that you want to ignore, but they're the le leaders and the heroes sometimes. 
And so, so maybe we need to stop doing the same thing. Maybe we should do something different. And the idea, that was the idea behind the Vote Different ad. So both of those were very different from what you'd ever expect from political messaging, let alone a presidential ad. I had marijuana use in both of those ads. There, was, there were pic pictures of people smoking weed in the first one, and there they had Snoop Dogg, and there was somebody lighting up the uh, joint. And the idea was, we want, let's be a little bit edgy, let's be a little bit different, let's be a little bit fresh, let's just ignore the rules of politics. The idea here isn't about electability. The idea here is to get interest. The idea here is to, to be the interesting, exciting option. And that's what we were trying to do. And so to change it up completely, I had six videos. I'm not going to play them all, but there's another short one I'm about to play. I wanted to change it up completely with a third video to show a different way of messaging. I'm going to play the third one. Double click. <coughs> There was a total of six, but those were very different presidential political ads. And that's what I hope we can do. I just want to inspire some innovation. Please think differently. And please, let's focus on being an interesting option and allow, let's encourage sales. That's what we need. And meaning we need to connect to other groups and we need to be something different. So let's be, we are stale. Let's be innovative. That's my basic point. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Judd. Um, yeah, we've received a few questions, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to stick to two questions. Um, so first one was to Austin. Uh, the question was, um, what would be the best use of your time to promote liberty when you're on such a short, you know, free time, but essentially yeah. you're working full time, etc. So that totally depends on your skills and your interests. And what you want to be doing is, is, is first thinking, do I have anything that I can uniquely contribute to the movement? So if you have, for example, video editing skills, or if you have public speaking skills, those are unique skills that not everyone has. That's a good way for you to contribute. If you don't have any time at all and you don't have any skills, but maybe you have some money, you can donate. Right? So no matter what you are doing, there is a way you can contribute, but that's gonna depend on your individual skills and then your interests. You obviously wanna be doing something that you actually care about doing. Awesome. And to Judd, uh, got a question about um, promoting liberty in university campuses, and obviously, if you wanna make liberty cool, the university campus is probably one of the first places you start. Um, so did you find any particular tactics that you found worked a lot with students in terms of promoting liberty and making it cool? Well, the first video showed you those photos that I took, and I'm hearing from people, I go to Young Americans for Liberty events and Students for Liberty events, 
those are the biggest armies of libertarian student activists in the United States. And I'm hearing from people that they just came to the, those events because they saw all these cool pictures of their friends. And, and the idea is we didn't make, we need the, the scene to look cooler. And so what I'm trying to do with, with those photos is make these nerds look cooler. <laughs> one nerd at a time. And I want them to have more white swipes on Tinder. <laughs> Because if these guys don't get more rights wipes, I don't think we have any hope. <laughs> right? And if, and if the guys look cooler, more girls show up. And, more, and it becomes more of a cool social scene. And, and that's what I'm seeing from the younger crowd. Because when I came into this uh, in the mid-90s, when I was like 15, 16, I was a teenager, I would show up at these libertarian meetups at Denny's. And I was like the only, me and my friend were the only high school age kids. Everybody else was like three or four times our age. They're all in like oversized white shirts and flip flops and, and, and pizza stains. And like it was like really grungy and not very exciting look to be part of this. And now if you look at the younger crowd, they look so cool. It's, it's really picking up. It's, it's really becoming diverse. And we're hitting more and more demographics. That I think is much more important than even uh, than debating all the different ideas and arguing with people. Is we need to be not those socially awkward nerds you want to avoid, but how do I get into that? Because that's really cool. That's what I'm trying to bring to the table. And I'm seeing people actually join because of that. Um, so I, I have lots to say, but the basic, most important thing is we need to be the interesting group. Awesome. And Andrew, just finally, someone in the crowd was interested in the transcript of your dinner speech. Um, yeah, someone was just interested in, so, yeah, yeah, found it. Um, yeah, and so that wraps up the final session of the day. Uh, just a round of applause for our panelists.